So a warm good evening to our speaker, Professor Ajayan sir, and our director sir, and the students who have joined us. I, Ajju, on behalf of the external extreme of IIT Hyderabad, invites you all to the first EML of this year, 2022. So we, the external team of IIT Hyderabad, works to bring decorated personalities from elected domains to talk about subjects like art, science, science social, and psychology to inspire our IIT fraternity with insights that they can use in their lives. That being said, I would like to invite our director, sir, and our uh, guest and speaker, Ajayan, sir, to light the day and inaugurate the event. First, uh, before you skip on uh, chair and then sit, so that there is some social distancing. Please. Make an ask for social distancing and mask. Yes, someone can be in there. Now I request our directors are to address the event. Good evening, friends. Very happy to have Professor Ajayan, a very good friend of mine, and a very well-accomplished personality in the field of material science. Everybody who is in the nano area all know him so well. And we are fortunate that he has accepted to be a distinguished professor of IIT Hyderabad. It's an honor to IIT Hyderabad to have such people as distinguished professors with us. And uh, he, we have been waiting for him to visit. Of course, last one year has been very difficult time, of course, close to about uh, two years now. And uh, But he made it a point that uh, this year, in the beginning itself, he is able to come to India. And then he said, if I am coming to India, I'm going to be there at IIT Hyderabad. So he made it up. And thank you very much. Of course, though the situation all around is, appears to be not so uh, encouraging as far as uh, having meetings of this nature is concerned, but at least uh, uh, we felt it is good to take such an opportunity uh, of uh, such a versatile personality who has come all the way uh, to get some benefit out of his visit and listen to him. How is that from days of IIT, BHU, BTEC? How did he grow till a stage where everybody 
uh, is amazed at his uh, growth. So let's listen from his own uh, words of his journey, uh, which I'm sure will be an inspiration to most of you. And he is an inspiration to me also. And, and I'm sure he's an inspiration to many. And so with those few, few words, welcome uh, again to come forward. First slide I'll start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can use it. On ever. I would should I is it good? Okay, good evening, and uh, thank you so much, Professor Murthy, for that kind introduction. We have known each other for quite a while, and uh, we admire each other's work. Uh, and I think you should be fortunate to have somebody like him as your director uh, who has the long-term vision to build uh, <clears throat> an area of excellence here. So normally, you know, I give technical talks and I'm sure you do the same thing. <clears throat> and it's not very often that people come and ask me to give an inspirational talk, but I suppose with age, that's what happens, you know? And uh, I can certainly share with you some moments that I have gone through in my career uh, in terms of uh, at least my perspective about what excellence should be, especially in a, in a university setting. <clears throat> you know, just to kind of go back a little bit today, we had a long discussion of various things with uh, very, very young faculty who have been hired here. And I can see that they're all striving for excellence. You know, I think that that's, that, that motivation is what ultimately makes uh, institutions. And I hope it will continue and those people will do very well. And that's my you know, first wish that next time I come here, you'll see all those people really prosper and uh, do what they are supposed to do. <clears throat> uh, on another note, um, you know, excellence is a very difficult thing to really define. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people, asked me, uh, you know, what, what is it that you actually did uh, to be successful? Like, and again, success is another word that is hard to define, and each person has their own definition. Uh, it, it's, if I think back, it's hard to tell what actually triggered, you know, a journey that ultimately leads to uh, some contributions that becomes valuable. <clears throat> Sometimes my, my family asks me, so who is your best student? You know, again, if I think about it, it's hard to really tell. You know, there are students who have published 50 papers during their tenure as a PhD student. And there are students who have just published a couple of papers, but perhaps started a company, right? And there are students who are extremely knowledgeable by the time they graduate, but haven't really published that much or, you know, uh, started a company for that matter. I think I consider all these excellence, right? I mean, if somebody has learned significant amount of material during his time, he can use that for his future uh, career, and he would certainly be successful at some point in time, right? So defining excellence or, you know, uh, of course, there are these days metrics that you can use, you know, you can use citations, you can use H indexes. And again, these are all pieces that ultimately make up some definition. 
So it's hard to tell, you know. So what I really want to do today is to at least uh, try to think about some framework in which we all can work and be productive and I suppose in the end be excellent in our contributions, uh, particularly from a university point of view. You know, uh, the, the companies might have very different set of, uh, you know, protocols and uh, platforms that, you, that make you successful. Uh, but my experience is mostly for, coming from the university side, research side, education and training side. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, before I even do that, let me put up this uh, a great quote from uh, one of the greatest uh, physicists, Machio Kaku, uh, who really kind of tells us, and this is again uh, almost uh, obvious, that uh, the next decade, the next several decades that you're going to uh, see in our lifetime uh, is going to be very different. You know, science and technology has really changed society beyond our imagination. And this has happened in such rapid pace that it's hard to imagine what's coming next. You know, just imagine a simple thing like, uh, you know, internet or cell phone. Uh, you know, that, that has changed our lifestyle, not just, uh, uh, you know, technological products. And as we continue to do this, you know, things like data coming into the picture, you know, ubiquitous sensors all over the place, uh, these are all going to impact our lives, our society, and how we live together. So, I mean, if you think about the last couple of years, it, it's, it's, it has been a very, very challenging time period, right? I mean, the COVID has hit it in us in many different ways, but because of technology, we were able to manage. You know, imagine if you didn't have the Zoom technology, right? What would have happened? Imagine the discoveries in biotechnology created the mRNA vaccines in such a short period of time. What would have happened to us? Right? So I think we owe a lot to technology and science and since we are practitioners of that field, we should be really proud. And I also want to add that, you know, everything that we do builds on what other people have done, right? So it's a collective effort. And this, that's also a great thing about this field, that uh, we work together, we work for the betterment of mankind. I think that, just, that should be the definition of excellence in some sense, right? This is not me. I can use this. I can also use this one. No, we have stuff. Talking. Well, I suppose technologies can be challenging as well, <clears throat> but that's what uh, we will ultimately do, right? To get over all these glitches and ultimately have a seamless. <clears throat> so, just uh, to give you an idea of, uh, again, I'm sure that you are all aware of many of these things and you're informed about uh, many of these technologies. But this is kind of a my personal list of. Uh, uh, you know, important technologies that are <coughs> changing the world in many ways, you know, all the way from mobile devices to the Internet of Things to renewable energy to additive manufacturing and data-driven technologies. But in many of these, materials plays a big role, right? Advanced materials play a very big role in almost everything, perhaps to a lesser extent in things like data-driven technologies. Uh, but it's important for us to realize that these things are again very interdisciplinary and uh, you know as i was talking to professor murthy earlier on uh, there are many programs now not dependent on department lines but interdisciplinary approaches and many of these things are uh, you know result of people from different fields working together and these are you know essentially the next decade or two decades of change that is going to come to us and we are going to be all beneficiaries and in some, in some areas, maybe even, uh, you know, challenging uh, situations uh, when these things come into practice. Uh, so 
you know, scientists and engineers work hand in hand to make these things happen. And, you know, again, don't take things for granted. This is what I always tell my students. You know, what you see in front of you, maybe as a cell phone, which is kind of a normal thing these days, but enormous amount of work has gone into building that product. And if you have an appreciation for that, and again, I've seen that depending on the countries that you are in, that appreciation differs. I mean, you know, if you go to a place like Japan, there is a much better appreciation of technologies because I think there is a understanding that this is because of a lot of work that people have done, right? A lot of so many, so many hundreds and thousands of hours that are uh, behind the scene to make that happen and make it available to you. So as you live your lives, have an appreciation for, you know, the products that you use and at least, you know, for a moment, sit and think back and see, uh, you know, what, what is the origin of all these, you know, how, who has created these and how that has changed our society. So that's one, uh, you know, suggestion that I have that, you know, don't take things for granted, but understand and realize and be part of this revolution that is happening. And my today's talk again. Uh, I come from Rice University. It's a hundred year plus, hundred plus year university uh, in Houston, uh, Texas, which is kind of a mega city. It's always considered to be the energy capital of the world because oil and gas companies had uh, major uh, centers in Houston, uh, headquarters in Houston. But even that is changing. And you know, I talked about change, and that is what really is happening. You know, there's a significant shift from the fossil-based energy to uh, renewable energies like EVs and things like that. And you are going to see that also in India. Uh, so even, uh, you know, a mega trend uh, of energy has significant changes in the recent times. Uh, so you know, technology brings in this change. Uh, and you know, I want to again talk about uh, something that is more related to my own research and my own uh, you know, perspective, experience over the years. As Professor Murthy said, you know, I graduated from Benares in the university as an undergraduate in, in metallurgical engineering. You know, we were looking at very uh, traditional uh, you know, core metallurgy principles, you know, extractive metallurgy, how do you make steel and things like that. Uh, and then you know, that kind of gave me uh, an inspiration to study further into understanding of materials and uh, went to PhD to Northwestern University. And that's where I started. And that's the first time I had this uh, uh, connection with nano. And uh, since that time, it has always been a major part of my uh, academic career. And I also wanted to acknowledge, you know, the people who actually do all the work. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, if you look at it's a snapshot, and it, again, it keeps changing because people come and go, as, uh, as in any research group. Uh, it's actually a cross section of the of the world in some sense. You know, the last time I counted, we had about sixteen different countries represented in my group. So people from all over the place come. People with different uh, cultural background and languages and ideas come, but we all speak a universal language. That is the language of science, and that unifies everybody. Right? And I'm sure it is happening exactly the same here. You know, people from different states who speak different languages, they all come together. And there is a common theme and common language that actually uh, is much more logical, much more uh, you know, clear. Uh, and that's, that's why uh, you can be uh, the person you are. Right? So uh, something has to be said about uh, uh, practicing science and technology. You know, wherever you are in the world, whichever state you are coming from in India, we all follow the same kind of logic, and that, that's, that's a wonderful thing. It doesn't happen in any other field. And universities are wonderful places. At least they're supposed to be great places because that's where uh, you know, free uh, thinking happens, right? We are not bound by uh, any restrictions that uh, many other places face, you know, politically or religiously or, you know, uh, if you're in a corporation, they have their own mandates and so on. But universities are places where, you know, a, a free uh, thinking happens and, uh, uh, you know, we are not restricted by any uh, uh, specific constraints. Uh, and this is where we interact with people. You know, we have complete uh, openness 
And uh, uh, you know, this is just a snapshot of a picture from a graduation convocation that is a culmination of lots of years of work. And when people come together, that's really a, a joy because it's not just about uh, getting a degree. It is about a journey of five years to six years, depending on where you are, which department you are, uh, a learning experience, you know, interacting with your mentors. And that kind of an environment is really a beautiful environment. Right. I mean, if I think go back into my own life, you know, it was the graduate school days that I still cherish as the most uh, uh, beautiful days, right? because that's when you know th there was complete freedom in thinking, uh, complete openness in interacting with people, uh, you know, excited about experiments. Uh, all kinds of beautiful things happened during that time. In fact, uh, you know, recently uh, I was talking to a graduate student of mine. <laughs> Uh, and she asked me, I, I was kind of surprised that she asked me this. She asked me, Professor Jain, do you actually dream about your research? So I was like, wow, I mean, no, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I didn't really, but then when I looked back and, you know, I, I was starting to answer to her question, I said, uh, you know, yes, absolutely. You know, if, if I really remember uh, during my graduate days and postdoctoral days, uh, there were experiments that did not leave me, you know, even in my sleep. It was always there. I was always thinking about things. And, and I'm sure at least a fraction of you are in that mode. And that's what really, you know, uh, is the most exciting, motivating thing that you can find in your life, right? You should be consumed with what you're doing, right? Uh, for, for no real personal gain. It's just uh, an intellectual thing, right? I mean, you know, I have this problem that is in my head and I want to solve this problem, you know? That, that feeling of intensity, that feeling of sustainability is, you, you cannot get it anywhere else. You know, even if you get a million dollars, I wouldn't feel that, you know, that, that intensity. So that, that, that's, that's what that happens when you are involved in research and, you know, uh, discoveries and things like that. I mean, it may not be the case in every case, uh, in a, every scenario, uh, but, you know, if, if at, at least at some point in your you know, degree or postdoctoral time, you should feel that. And, and there is a special thing about it. Now, thinking about, you know, excellence, uh, which is a topic of uh, this uh, discussion, uh, I, I was actually thinking, you know, what, what makes things work? Well, you know, what, what would you consider as a discovery that means something? You know, how do you create an environment for this, right? So if you look at many of the discoveries, uh, all the way from quantum mechanics to, uh, you know, maybe high entropy <laughs> alloys, uh, th th there is always a history behind it, you know, and, and that can be kind of separated, this discovery, uh, th this phases can be separated that ultimately leads to major discoveries and breakthroughs. And, uh, you know, first of all, it's about ideas, knowledge, ideas, right? I mean, we are all trained in certain areas, and whether you're thinking independently or you're talking to other people, uh, there is this ideation time, right? You're creating new ideas, right? new ideas come to your mind. Uh, and, you know, maybe you have a mentor who actually discusses these ideas with you. And then, you know, kind of codifying these ideas. You know, we, have, we all have ideas, right? We have sometimes tens, hundreds of ideas in a week. Uh, but maybe all of them are not very, you know, practical. So you work with your mentor and see, maybe there are some that really make sense. So, you know, then there is that, 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 that part that really defines what ideas you're go, going to go after. And of course, you have to be motivated. Uh, motivation is something very difficult to do. Uh, and I constantly strive uh, as an advisor to motivate students. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes it works. I believe that in our case, most of the time it actually has worked <coughs> to, you know, again, uh, you, you have an idea and how do you really pursue that idea? So you have to kind of have uh, you know, uh, the students who really believe in it, you know, belief is again, something that is uh, not very discreet. Uh, and, uh, you know, making somebody believe in things uh, is really the job of a, a good mentor. And, and of course, that person takes that idea, and he's motivated, and he goes and starts experiments in the lab, or if you're a theorist, starts playing around with his uh, uh, programs. And then one day, you know, it may not happen the next day or the next month or the next year, but one day during this period of time where you are a student or a postdoc, uh, suddenly Eureka moment comes, right? You come up with an, a, a discovery. And the discovery doesn't have to be really 
you know, out of the world or groundbreaking, it still it is a discovery. You have solved the problem. You have created, a, a, you know, you have figured out a new thing. You have found a new image that may mean something. And so that, that's, a, that, that's the point of really the, 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 the best point in your, uh, you know, research career. And once you have that, of course, you know, you present it to your mentor, you actually, uh, you know, uh, try to put this into a storyline and ultimately you have to publish it or patent it or whatever you, you, your, uh, your mentor tries to tell you. And, and that's, that's a great stage. I think that's the most beautiful stage because, uh, you, you know, it, it is a fruit of these months and maybe years of work that ultimately has created uh, a, a nice moment. Uh, once it is put into the public or you know, published or something like that, then there is a stage where you have to verify, you know, independently. Uh, you know, some, many people may not believe if you start to talk about a great discovery. I mean, uh, discovery of quasi crystals was a great example, right? Uh, people didn't believe that you can have materials that have five-fold symmetry. Uh, and it went through a long period of time of debate and ultimately it was proven right and the person received the Nobel Prize. Right? So many, many such cases that has been there in, uh, in history of science. Uh, but that is important because independent verification is important uh, so that people believe in it, a uh, broader range of people believe in it. Uh, and and then, then there is various kinds of dissemination. You know, it, it, it spreads, uh, you know, the idea spreads, the verification spreads. <laughs> and then there is an interesting time frame where uh, at least in some cases, a transition from the pure research to applied research. You know, it doesn't happen in all cases, but and in some cases it might take very long time. Right? So that, that's, uh, that's what ultimately uh, leads to product development and ultimately societal uh, impact and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but I, I want to also mention something. And you know, many times these excellence that you talk about, you know, that comes out of these different phases uh, are very much spe very specific to environment and you know the resources and and the infrastructure and lo lots of different reasons. So this is actually an interesting uh, uh, the plot that I took from one of these nature journal uh, publications, and it tells you uh, you know the proportion of papers that nature has published. And nature is a good indicator because it publishes the really the top end uh, uh, work. Uh, all the way from the 1950s to uh, 2010s. And if you look at the 1950s, you know, just after independence, India actually features in that, in that uh, plot, right? UK was leading, uh, then the United States was there because a lot of immigrants from Europe had gone into US to establish uh, centers and uh, research programs. And India was there, it was significantly there. And then it kind of you know, dropped off and slowly US took over the UK prominence and it kind of expanded because there was a lot of resources and energy put into building research infrastructures in the US. And then in the 2000s, you can see China has expanded right, big time. And it's probably going to be as big as the US in terms of publication. And again, this is just an indicator. You know, it has nothing to do with uh, uh, the comprehensive analysis of which country is doing well. But it shows something, it shows that as the environment changes as the support system changes, uh, you know, the, the productivity, the, the outcome also changes. And it's an interesting uh, thing I found. <clears throat> now, in terms of uh, translation, which many of you probably are interested in, because now this is the age where you want to kind of convert ideas into products as quickly as possible. And this is very important, not just uh, in India, but also in other countries. The US also focuses now on translational research quite a bit, in addition to publications and so on. And this actually shows this, uh, 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 this timeline between basic science to commercialization. And what is very interesting in this is something that I mentioned in the previous slide, you know, the sustainable effort that, that's in it, that starts from the point of innovation to the ultimate commercialization. And what is even more interesting is there is something called this valley of death, which again, some of you might, might have heard. You know, as the money for base or resources available for basic research kind of goes down with time, you know, for example, there is a flashy thing that happens, let's say graphene, right? So there's a lot of money pumped into graphene because everybody believes that it's going to save the world. 
right? And that will sustain for a while. But then after a while, depending on how long it takes for these to be translated into commercial products, the, the funding for basic research kind of decreases in that area, right? Then somehow, if this has to sustain further, it has to be picked up by venture capitalists and other kinds of funding that is available to productize or commercialize these things. And that the, the, the time lag between this basic research money and uh, the funding or resources for commercialization really could trap you in this valley of death and many of the things that do not really make it. Right? And this is a typical thing that we talk about uh, when we talk about entrepreneurial folks and who wants to you know, build things and commercialize it. And uh, uh, you know, that, that, that probably has also some uh, implication on where you are. Uh, you know, for example, if you're in the Bay Area where there is so many people interested in investing and so on, you, know, you might be able to avoid that to some extent, but in general, we talk about this value of that, right? So that, that's something to remember. Uh, in terms of actually taking your ideas all the way through the innovation process to commercialization, uh, these are things that you can remember. Now, again, as I said before, most of my work has been related to nanotechnology. So I'll tell you maybe uh, a couple of stories related to that uh, or experiences in my research area that uh, kind of gives you an idea of uh, what we have done. So one of my first uh, uh, connection with nanotechnology is when I was a PhD student at Northwestern, and we were essentially looking at uh, uh, small particles, nanoparticles. And uh, you know, the, the nano, even the, the term nano had not gotten uh, you know, much popularity at that time. So my thesis actually says small particles, not really nano. The nano came after a major initiative in the US in the early 90s, and then it became uh, a, big, uh, a big prefix. <clears throat> uh, but what was interesting during that time is that uh, for the first time, people were figuring out how you can image these nanoparticles at atomic resolution and how, what, what the properties of these nanoparticles are and how they can be correlated with uh, uh, you know, structure. Uh, so we were looking at nanoparticles, uh, which are very, very small, which undergo what is called structural changes or, or fluctuations, phase transitions. Uh, and and what, is, what we realized, again, uh, this has uh, been theoretically predicted for a long time before, is that as you go to very, very, very small scale, uh, the stability has a different meaning, right? I mean, so it depends on your uh, morphological energy free, uh, free energy diagram. So if there are multiple phases and structures that have very uh, close uh, gap in energy, the thermal energy available to the system or any kind of energy that is su supplied to the system can change these things between different uh, uh, phases. Uh, so we call it, uh, you know, it, it, for example, a small particle if you take, they undergo structural phase transition very fast. They create all these twins and so on. And uh, you know, it's not really melting because they're still crystalline, but uh, we call it quasi-melting. <laughs> so this was you know, my first uh, uh, introduction to nanoparticles. And during my PhD, I was fortunate enough to kind of find some really cool things with these nanoparticles. And we published uh, in journals such as Physical Review Letters and Nature and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, one other message that I have to give uh, the students is that, you know, there is that if you can go deeper into any particular area, you will find some unique aspects that is worthwhile to tell the public or you know to publish and so on. So I think we were um, we were fortunate enough. Nano has various levels of impact, right? And all the way from the understanding. And so on, uh, their hardware, uh, the, the basic devices have reached levels of the nanoscale, right? Uh, you know, maybe working even further than seven nanometers, but that's really, really small. So imagine this whole idea of uh, building very, very complex architectures with millions and millions of devices with that kind of length scales. 
I mean, that itself is really should be motivating enough, right? That you know, over the years, over two or one, you know, two or three decades, people have really figured out to make these complex architectures, uh, computer architectures. And, and again, this is all driven by some basic uh, uh, foundational research that was done during the quantum days in the uh, you know, during the war and a bit later, and that has translated into. A significant amount of understanding and uh, that, uh, you know building of devices. So that, that's again uh, you know something to think about, right? It, take, it took almost fifty years to really translate something that was predicted to uh, something that one can use in reality. So the, the nano is fascinating in many ways, uh, part, you know, because it's commercially very valuable uh, at this moment and you know slowly the nano is changing into the quantum regime right quantum materials is becoming important the question is how we can manipulate single atoms and single defects and you know create devices based on that uh, but also uh, there are many other applications of nano uh, but uh, what really is fascinating about nano is that as you go down to smaller and smaller scales things behave differently right so there's a fundamental paradigm change when you go to that scale. You know, gold that is yellow becomes pink when it is small, right? Or red, uh, you know, colors change. Electronic properties change. Catalytic properties change. So a whole of nanotechnology is about understanding the structure property correlation as you go down in scale. And, you know, we're still in the midst of this, right? There are multiple aspects of this nano. One, of course, is this, uh, this strict uh, um, you know, property correlation with structure. Uh, the other aspect is essentially the whole idea of manufacturing can change. The paradigm can change from the top-down manufacturing approach that we have used over the years to something bottom-up. You know, so, uh, so again, from a synthetic world to biological world, there is a significant difference. One relies on top-down manufacturing. You, you machine, you, you know, uh, do lithography and create patterns and shapes and structures and architectures. Uh, but in the biological world, it's all built up from up, right? You start with molecules, the mineralize, and deposit, uh, you know, layers, and ultimately build up structures. So th this very, very different uh, aspects of manufacturing is now coming into play with better, uh, you know, uh, handle on how to manage or manipulate nanoparticles. So that, that's again in your lifetime you will see how these two different manufacturing approaches uh, kind of merge. You might have heard of additive manufacturing or 3D printing. That's one case of bottom-up building things, right? And there's so many, many advantages of this bottom-up manufacturing. Of course, 3D printing still cannot go to very low resolution, but nevertheless, you know, it's it's a paradigm shift on how we are going to look at manufacturing in the future. You know, I said nanotechnology is about manufacturing with atoms. So ultimately, it could be a real reality, right? Whether it is nanoparticles or all the way to atoms, you know, we are trying to build different ways of building things. I mean, nature, as I already mentioned about nature, you know, this is a beautiful, exquisite example of nanoengineering, where the you know, nanoparticles of ceramic has been packaged with uh, protein molecules so that you create an extremely tough material. You know, this, this, this is basically calcium carbonate, right? A very, very brittle material, but when it is nanoengineered, packaged in these interfaces that are soft material, it becomes a super hard material. So nano engineering, bottom up engineering, uh, building hierarchy, all these things have relevance and that's going to play out in the next uh, phase of manufacturing like additive. And, and again, there's a lot of talk about nano and how this is going to impact the world. And uh, you know, this was a study that we did, a worldwide study, uh, I was leading that study to go and see how the development of nanotechnology is going to impact the world. And we can see that uh, you know, from basic components that was really hot in the 2000s to system integration happening 2010 to 20 maybe, to really technology divergence in the in, in the next decade. So you know, I, you already I already mentioned that um, uh, the semiconductor industry is already at that nano scale to build devices. So there's going to be a significant technology divergence, uh, you know, uh, starting uh, in in the coming future. Uh, so that nano will have impact in many areas of applications, which ultimately will directly impact your life. Now, going back a little bit on this uh, innovations and uh, uh, things like that, I want to tell a story of a particular discovery that happened at Rice University and 
I was fortunate enough to kind of take it afterwards uh, into other kind of materials. But this is another interesting, uh, uh, you know, report that Nature published in 2019. And over the last many, many decades that they have been in existence, Nature Journal, they chose 10 extraordinary papers, right, and listed them and asked people to write about these things. So it's remarkable if you look at this, this uh, list, you know, it goes all the way from detection of a strange particle to uh, uh, the discovery of Australopithecus uh, and how they became part of the human evolution to porous materials to the DNA, right? So it, it's a broad range of discoveries that really change science and how we look at, uh, uh, you know, our, our own <coughs> technological uh, relevance. Out of these 10, there was one, which was the nano revolution spawned by carbon, right? So that, that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about because that was, that is part of what I did in my career in the beginning. So the discovery of polarines is a very interesting story. And assuming that most of you have heard of this, because fullerenes has become almost, uh, uh, you know, uh, a commonplace for anybody who does science. Uh, there are a couple of things that I want to say. One was that it was discovered by uh, two people at Rice and one visitor from University of Sussex. Uh, so the two people at Rice are Richard Smalling, who's no more, Robert Curl, who's still at Rice, and uh, Harry Croto is no more, but he was a visitor from uh, Sussex University. And the interesting thing about this is that Smalley and Curl, they were trying to look at clusters by laser ablating and using mass spec to uh, understand how these clusters look like. And Harry Croto was actually an astrophysicist, uh, who astrochemist, I should say. He was interested in looking at the structure of carbons in the planetary space and so on. So he was doing a lot of spectroscopy. And he made a visit to uh, Rice uh, in the early, the late 80s. 1980s, uh, and again, this is a story that probably you know uh, has been played out in many different scenarios, and this is also a message in the sense that you know when two when people with different backgrounds come together and talk science, something new could happen, right? And this is precisely the reason why you're building these interdisciplinary programs, and this is very important and core to any scientific uh, endeavors that you have to really be open to you know, talk to people who are not in the field, but who understand science and, and you know, make it a habit. You know, I keep my students, you know, don't talk between yourself in, in the group, go and talk to somebody who's doing something else, right? So that you get uh, uh, that, uh, that interdisciplinary field. So anyway, the fullerenes were discovered at Rice, you know, that was kind of the beginning of this nano revolution because for the first time people realized that you can have a pure carbon molecule with such beautiful structure, you know, a very high symmetry icosahedra with uh, 60 atoms of carbon. It's also a very interesting story because, I mean, Curl, Smalley, and Croto were not the first people who actually saw this material. Right? There were many works predating it, essentially looking at mass spec of ablated carbon, and people like, uh, you know, groups from um, Exxon and other companies those days had already published mass spec with a very huge peak at 60 atom carbon, suggesting that there is something there, right? Uh, but they didn't really manage to come out with a structure that, that is C60, right? And, and, and that's again, you know, what innovation is all about. You know, when, when suddenly somebody tells you that, okay, there is this new molecule with 60 atom carbon that is very, very uh, stable, uh, how do you come out of the structure, right? I mean, you can have a linear chain, you can have a flat uh, graphene-like material, uh, and nobody would have thought that you would have something like a you know, closed shell uh, structure with a certain number of hexagons and certain number of pentagons, which actually create curvature, right? So it was the ingenuity of these folks who decided to sit together and play around, draw by hand, you know, what kind of structure that might have. And they spend nights and days and thinking about this, dreaming about it, and maybe even not sleeping about it, right? Uh, and ultimately, they something dawned on them saying that, okay, boy, this is the structure. But it's, the amazing thing is that this structure was always there in front of you. You know, the, the soccer ball that 
people were using, not the latest design, but the ones that uh, was very prevalent, had exactly this structure. They had 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons, and they had the fullerene. But that connection was very difficult to make. And it, in, in research and discoveries, is all about making connections, you know, thinking out of the box. Right? You're working on something. And again, this is something that I tell my students. Yeah, you have a goal, you have some objectives, but look sideways all the time, right? You never know what, what, what is interesting in what you're doing. And this was a beautiful, perfect example of this. Right? So that was the discovery of fullerenes. And again, there's another story associated with it, and that is the name of this molecule. You know, Buckminster Fuller uh, somehow came into the picture. Right? He was not involved in any of these discoveries. He was not even close. Right? So, but why was it called fullerenes? Yeah, somebody on the other side of the world was trying to build architectural structures, you know, geodesic domes with the same kind of symmetry. And once these people discovered that this is a structure, it was very easy to make these connections. And somehow the name of Fuller stuck. So again, it's one of those instances where somebody was just passing by, got his name you know, involved in the Nobel Prize discovery. And it actually stayed. You know, nobody talks about small lean or something like that. Right? It's all Fullerings. It's, it's on Buckminster Fuller, who was an architect. But again, you know, there's no logic sometimes in uh, how things happen. And again, uh, there's no logic in how things happen. This is a good example. The discovery of C60 came in the uh, mid 80s, right? And then in the 90s, the carbon nanotube structure was discovered, right? And then later on, in the 2000s, early 2000s, graphene was discovered, right? So ideally, all these structures emanate from graphite, which is the uh, most uh, uh, thermodynamically stable structure of carbon, you know, this layered structure, uh, things that you find in your uh, pencil and things like that, you know, flat layers of graphene stacked together as graphite. So ideally, if we were to think intuitively, I would have thought that the graphene would be the first discovery, because the simplest thing was to just peel off one layer and look at it, right? But it didn't happen that way. Now, again, it shows how discoveries happen. There's a lot of serendipity. There's a lot of, uh, you know, orthogonality in how things happen. And, and, and this is something that you students should think about. Always remind yourself that, you know, anybody can make a great discovery. I mean, you're all in institutions where there's good infrastructure, good mentors. So don't feel that, you know, you have to be in a big university, you know, somewhere to make a discovery. You know, discoveries are anybody's take, right? So don't just uh, sit on things, uh, think deeply and try to see what you can come, you know, bring out from what you, your research work. But this is again an interesting story that I want to mention. And I happen to be uh, at a place called NEC Corporation in the early 90s uh, in Japan. I was actually doing my postdoc right after my PhD. And that is the time frame. Again, sometimes timing works out very well. 1990, I came to NEC. And in 1990 was the, the, the first paper on carbon nanotube that was published by Sumi Ujima, again in Nature. Right? And there were several other papers that we all published together in the next uh, few years. And that's again, you know, that, that was probably the most motivating time of my life, you know, the cutting edge stuff that you're doing. Again, that's when you, you really lose sleep. Uh, you know, thinking about what is next. Anything that you do with this new material will be a paper in nature, right? So that, that, that was the kind of feeling that we all had. So, you know, I'm sure that most of you will ride, you know, some of those waves in your career, whether during your time here or, you know, once you start your job, starting a company, whatever it is. It's important. Those moments are probably the most precious that you will ever find. So this was the first paper by Sumio Jima in 1991. Uh, then uh, this was right after it was a paper that was published by myself and Ijima saying that, uh, uh, you know, the first paper talked about these uh, multi-layer nanotubes, helical uh, structures. Uh, and then we kind of suggested that maybe uh, there's a possibility that you can have a single ball nanotube. It was not really a, a real synthesis paper, but at least an identification of a structure that might look like a single wall nanotube. And then there were several papers that followed in 1993 that uh, showed that you can have single wall nanotube. And then, you know, there, there was a humongous number of papers published in the next few years. 
you know, citations, like I think the first paper got like 50,000 citations so far. So I think, you know, it, it became a field in itself. So that was a really, really an exciting time uh, for nanotechnology, you know, carbon-based nanomaterials uh, and so on. This was the paper 92 by myself and another person at NEC. Uh, look at that beautiful structure, you know, this, this beautifully, you know, crystalline, a multi wall nanotube that are uh, almost perfection to its limit. And that's what nanotechnology is about, right? You want to create structures that are really perfect, you know, uh, really small. And what was also fascinating about nanotube is that by changing the structure, you could tune the electronic properties very well. So you can go from a semiconducting nanotube to a metallic nanotube by just having a small twist in the structure. So that again was a realization that when things are very small, small perturbations in the structure can have a significant change in the properties, right? And that led to enormous number of ideas, right? So uh, whether it is gold particles changing color or nanotubes changing the electronic structure, so these, these were again the early, early beginnings of nanotechnology, you know, from a science point of view. Uh, from a technology point of view, it took much le uh, later to figure out how you can integrate things, how you can connect these structures to you know contacts and you know create devices out of them, but again you know similar to this whole thing that I mentioned about quantum mechanics you know the foundations that were laid in the 40s and 50s it took a long time until it really became part of our lives right and similarly the nanotechnology is evolving and it's becoming part of our lives without with or without knowing really uh, obviously and then this is another interesting thing that we did. Uh, that relates to creativity and innovation, right? Uh, when you have something in your hand, you know, a project, uh, how do you really look at it? How do you innovate? And that, that, that's something, of course, you need to have the freedom to do that. But, you know, we, we were in this fundamental research lab uh, in Japan, and we have complete freedom to think about whatever you want to do. Uh, so we have this nanotube that was discovered, and we were all trying to figure out what, what could be of interest. You know, you have these tiny structures. Uh, and one day, you know, kind of talked about this and realized that uh, why not try to fill these nanotubes with something? And then you would have really a template in which you can create all kinds of materials. Right? So again, you know, that's a part of the ideation that I mentioned, right? Uh, of course, that was motivating because nobody had done that before. And then we played around with this for several months to see how we can actually get something in. And again, it was serendipity. Uh, we were just doing a simple experiment of heating a metal, which is low melting, uh, uh, depositing it on the nanotube and just he heating it. And it was enough to actually etch away part of the nanotube, create a hole, and the whole thing got sucked in because of capillary forces, right? And so that was the first instance where we were able to say that, okay, you can actually fill the structure. You know, this is, again, you know, people who are into publishing, you know, this particular paper was accepted in a couple of days. You know, it was kind of a record in my career. But again, it, it shows how, you know, creativity and, you know, uh, verification, uh, the good experimental technique that you need to have, of course, you need a high um, and microscopy, all come together and at the right time, you know, to really create something that is unique. And then, you know, over the over the years, to to okay, okay. So I'll, I'll finish with these couple of slides and then uh, we, then we can have some discussion. So I just want to show you a couple of examples as we went along. We did many things. You know, this was one of the Guinness Book of World Record. We are creating the smallest brush using nanotubes. This was another Guinness Book of World Record that was really uh, creating these forests of nanotubes that uh, really absorb a lot of light, making it the darkest material. So again, innovations are that uh, uh, keep uh, you know, some of these fields going. Uh, so again, uh, there, there's lots of interesting things related to nanotubes, I'll skip all these. And some of these are slowly becoming commercially viable products. You know, for example, very long fiber, now people can spin uh, you know, meters and meters of these nanotube fibers, which could be used as uh, uh, either reinforcing fibers or conducting fibers. I will just uh, skip all these and go to one slide that I wanted to show. Uh, this is again another example of how really good characterization techniques are also important uh, in your research facilities. You know, and I see that 
IIT Hyderabad is building really fantastic facilities in all these areas. So that that's really part of the the whole deal that you need to have those to be competitive, and you can make images like this, you know, where every atom can be visible. You know, Professor uh, uh, Murthy does uh, atom probe microscopy. You know, you can actually see every atom in the in a structure, and that's where the level of characterization that we can do these days. And this is just a stem image. This is energy filter. <laughs> so let me move on and show. Uh, I had the many slides, maybe I didn't realize how much I talk. Uh, so this is kind of the the last uh, slide that I will keep. Uh, and when I was thinking about, you know, uh, Professor Moti asked me to give this uh, talk about excellence in academia. Uh, I, I thought about uh, different things, and to me, you know, this whole ecosystem is what is important. Right? To be productive, to be excellent, uh, and that uh, kind of comes out as a tetrahedron. Tetrahedron has six edges, four faces, and four corners. Right? And you know, and there could be more. Maybe you know, uh, maybe it could be a different polyhedron. But to me, tetrahedron kind of suffices. So you know, th these are the, the edges that really you know bridge things together. Ideation, innovation, creativity, the thinking out of the box. Uh, of course, pedagogy because training is important. You know, you have to be prepared if you want to uh, do something. Uh, translation and societal impact. These are the real four edges that forms this tetrahedra. Uh, and then there are the faces, which are also extremely important in today's world. You know, collaboration, you know, individual collaboration, also collaboration with others to build larger efforts like centers. The interdisciplinarity uh, that is really bridging different disciplines together. Uh, and of course, you know, disability is important, you know, if you want resources. That's very important, right? And outreach, all this comes together. And then there, there are these corners that are really, uh, you know, very, very basic uh, needs for uh, facilitating this kind of uh, ecosystem. And that's the facilities, the human resources, of course, you know, you have already the best ones here. And leadership is very important as well. And of course, incentives, right? I mean, you have to incentivize for people to be motivated sometimes, and that's also important. So that's the ecosystem that I feel uh, is, you know, both for uh, smaller groups as well as for the larger institutions uh, that becomes uh, uh, very essential for uh, creating the right kind of outputs and right kind of visibility that uh, we talk about uh, in, in research. I mean, sustaining excellence in research is always a challenge, you know, because um, I've seen many places where you know things start really good and then kind of plateau. Uh, so I think this constant incentivizing and motivation is very very important. And uh, uh, so I, I will stop here uh, with one last thought, which says you know we all do our part and ultimately the world will benefit. And I think it's very important that we realize that we are a community who builds on others' work and we work together and. Uh, we should all be proud to be in this area of science and technology. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we can have a few questions. If anyone has a question, I'll take this. Good evening, sir. Uh, I'm Ashish. I'm currently pursuing the technical model. Uh, I've just learned about some of the remarkable discoveries in the field of science. So my question is, uh, how far is the present narrative uh, from building something really cool like Iron Man Thanos? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, yeah, the, there was a, there was a major project at MIT uh, almost ten or twenty years ago called the Soldier Nanotechnology Project, and the whole idea was to create this uh, Superman suit that would uh, essentially. Uh, be protective against anything that you throw at the uh, sense, everything that is close by, uh, and so on and so forth. Right? So I think the pieces are already there. You know, as I said before, you know, the world is going to be full of sensors and you know, detection devices and responsive structures. So from a materials point of view, a lot has been done already. Uh, integration is still sometimes an issue. Uh, but uh, those type of futuristic gadgets are coming. Uh, in fact, uh, 
one of my students is doing uh, a haptic suit that translates music into vibrations and uh, that, that, that you can feel music rather than hear music. I mean, again, this is just an example. Uh, so I think there are lots of interesting things that will come uh, with the nanotechnology enabled, uh, you know, efforts. But, uh, uh, you know, some of these futuristic things are good to imagine, uh, but maybe entirely it might take some more time to realize. Thank you. I am Orko from uh, Material Science, and uh, I'd like to know you have worked in different labs around the world uh, in different countries. So, which one is your like? Which environment do you like the best to work? Uh, do you have any personal? Well, I mean, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, I should I should be politically correct, uh, but uh, you know, each each country has its own ways of getting things done, right? I mean, Japan is very different from the U.S. How research is managed, how people are motivated. Uh, you know, I think the experience that I got from different countries certainly was very very helpful for me when I established uh, my research group in the U.S. Um, I mean, most of the work that we did, except for early stages, has been done in the U.S. So my experience mostly relates to work that was done in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is also very, you know, multicultural. The students come from all over the place, and uh, uh, you know, it's an interesting way of <laughs> interactive process that happens in the U.S. research uh, institutions. Uh, but I, I don't. It, it, again, it's it's a difficult question to uh, answer because it has got multiple answers, right? If you ask for specific things, uh, I could say, okay, Japan is good. You know, uh, in terms of openness, freedom, um, maybe U.S. is good, right? I mean, th th there's there's no one answer. Are you planning to go to some country, and is that the reason why you asked me this question? Yes. Sir, uh, like I am doing a PhD, here, so i'm thinking of going for a postdoc or something where i can go for a good uh, research environment so yeah. i mean i mean i, I would choose uh, you know uh, a really strong research group rather than a country per se uh, i think every country has very strong groups and that's what i would be advising you to yeah, do yes So I wanted to ask you that for us, for our generation, we are facing the crisis for our generation. So even you gave many good examples of discovery. And if you look at major discoveries, it has taken into, it was done in much darker times. So for us, who, for us, for whom our focus should be based on our research, but outside things are changing again and again. So how do we keep passing motivated? It's a very good question. I suppose you're referring to these times of COVID and others, right? I mean, my take is that, uh, you know, these things are certainly going to be temporary and it will pass. Uh, I understand that there are challenges, I mean, not just here, but throughout the world for students. You know, we always face, students have been uh, in difficult situations because they're staying at home and, you know, things like that. Uh, but I, I think if you are focused on the problems that you're trying to solve uh, and stay fixated on those problems, uh, I think that, that, that you shouldn't have that much of a concern. And I, I strongly believe that these times are going to pass very quickly. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't want to downplay the effect of uh, COVID and you know, situations like that, because it has had a huge impact. Uh, I mean, not just students, but everybody faces that problem, right? We face that issues in terms of funding and retaining, uh, you know, groups and research environment and all that. Uh, but I think we have survived so far. And as I started to say in the beginning, you know, many of the technologies that has been helpful to us has allowed us to circumvent some of these challenges. And not entirely, but uh, for sure, some of it. 
And um, I think the best option is for you to stay closely uh, in touch with this group and the mentors and uh, think positively. I mean, unfortunately, I can't you know, say anything more specific, but uh, I, I would say that this is a transitionary phase and uh, you, you'll be all back, maybe with you know, more uh, you know, motivation. We have the last question. I think there's a question there. <clears throat> Great question. I mean, I would say biology because I think, you know, the more uh, I have seen um, what is happening in, in the present world, I mean, I mean, biology has huge opportunities. You know, I think you're already seeing some of these technologies like CRISPR that is going to completely change the societal, you know, the way we live and societal impact. So definitely, if it was not material science, and again, when you are young, you know, you, you especially in our days, you know, we chose certain things because of limited options. You know, you guys have much larger options from an economic point of view, as well as from, uh, you know, uh, opportunities uh, that are available. Uh, so, I, and, and also the interface of biology with uh, materials or biology with electronics, I think this is just going to change uh, you know, society big time. So if somebody's in that interface, I mean, even, even if you're a material scientist, right? I mean, you can work with in that area. I think the bio, nano, bio materials, uh, bioelectronics interfaces are just uh, incredibly, uh, you know, exciting. Thank you. I invite our directors to hand the <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining in the session. The session is over. We will have a quite soon sessions in the upcoming months. Thanks for joining.